So welcome to the pandemic response reading series. My name is Lauren Carter. Um, and I'm broadcasting from just outside the city of Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, which is in Treaty One territory, the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg, the Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and also the homeland of the Metis Nation. And I am very grateful to call this place my home as well. So as I said, this afternoon is really extra special to me. Um, I met Ava when we were both on National Council for the Writers Union of Canada, and she has become a friend. And Ayala and I went to graduate school, school together through the University of Guelph MFA program. So it's really nice to reconnect with the two of them. And also this book, Daughters of Smoke and Fire, um, is, a, is an excellent, moving, um, vivid and authentic book uh, and definitely one you will want to get your hands on. So I really encourage you all to buy the book. Um, it, you know, extra points if you get it through your local independent bookseller or through your library as well. Um, it is such a tough time, as I've said, to launch a book this spring. So it really is helpful uh, to support writers and, and um, publishers as well, and independent bookstores to, to purchase the books. And you'll love it too. It's a great book. And also to get your reviews, post your reviews on, on Amazon, Goodreads, all the, the sites um, that really help support writers and get the word out. So um, without further ado, I will introduce Ayala Zabari. Ayala was born in Israel to a large family of Yemeni descent. She is the author of the memoir, The Art of Leaving, which was a finalist for the Writers Trust Hillary Weston Award uh, and a winner of the Canadian Jewish Literary Award for memoir and an Apple Books and Kirkus Review Best Book of 2019. Uh, her first book, the short story collection, The Best Place on Earth, also a fabulous book, won the Sammy Rohr Prize for Jewish Literature and the Edward Lewis Wallant Award. And it was a New York Times book review editor's choice and has also been published internationally. She teaches creative writing at the University of King's College MFA in creative nonfiction and at Tel Aviv University and I will invite Ayelet to unmute herself and turn her microphone on. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Yeah, and I'll just scoot out of here. So All right. Enjoy everyone. Um, so yeah, thank you, Lauren, for, for making this happen. Um, I'm just gonna find a way to make uh, my video a little bigger. There we go. Uh, it's funny how nervous I am. It's like, you know, I'm sitting at home in Tel Aviv. It's really hot <laughs> and I'm like staring at the screen and it feels like a really big deal. Um, so I want to thank you all for joining us from all kinds of places uh, to celebrate Ava Homa's debut novel, Daughters of Smoke and Fire, which was released uh, May 12th, just really recently. Uh, by Harper Colonist Canada and already garnered some great reviews and I'm going to mention a couple of them. Uh, if you haven't read it, like Lauren said, I highly recommend it. It's such a, I, I couldn't put this book down. Um, and it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce Ava Homa. Uh, she's a writer, a journalist, an activist specializing in women's issues and Middle Eastern affairs. She holds an MA in English and Creative Writing from the University of Windsor. Her collection of short stories, Echoes from the Other Land, another wonderful book, uh, was long listed for the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, and she is the inaugural recipient of the Penn Canada Humber College Writers in Exile Scholarship. Born and raised in the Kurdistan province of Iran, Homa now divides her time between Toronto and San Francisco. So we're really international today. Uh, and yeah, as I said, Daughters of Smoke and Fire is her debut novel. So um, Ava, please uh, turn on your video and join me so I won't be so lonely here in my little screen. Hi. Hi. 
Congratulations. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here. I am so grateful to Lauren for organizing it. To my sister in spirit, Ayala, for being here and having a conversation with me today. Um, and to everyone for making the time to attend this um, online book launch. I see a lot of familiar faces. My agents here, some of my friends. Um, I am so happy to be doing this. This is the best we can do under the circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> As yeah. uh, my friends pointed out, I poured my heart and soul into this book, spent 10 years on it, only to come out when the whole world shut down. So how does it feel to have it out, finally? Um, I am excited, and I am also scared. I feel like I'm walking now without clothes and feel exposed and skinless <laughs> but it's good it's good it's great yeah Ireland you're muted for some reason because I'm because okay there's yeah. noise in the background I was trying oh, okay. to mute it I'm like I have a family who's sleeping um or trying to um so I want to I want to show the picture of the book this the cover of it because apparently you only have the American cover. Maybe you can show it to us because it's different. Sure. Yeah. Um, can I tell the story of the design? Yeah. The, the, obviously, so this obviously, yeah. flower here, Schler, one of the characters is named Schler after this flower. This is a flower that grows across Kurdistan Plateau regardless of the borders. And it's a flower that grows in really difficult condition and comes in really vibrant colors. So red, orange, yellow. And it's a flower that as you can see, the petals look down. So it, it rises with a difficult condition with a lot of humility but it also has a crown and it has, it has this beautiful and rare combination of having a crown and also being really humble. Uh, so I thought this is the most non-political representative of Kurdistan. And I love it. I love both covers. You can now show the Canadian cover. I love that. That's beautiful. Yeah. Okay, here, I'll show you the, the Canadian cover, also beautiful. And I'm going to um, read a couple uh, short, you know, reviews of it. Uh, it's, I'll, I'll speak a bit about it and I hope you will speak more of it. Uh, it's set in Iran um, and it takes us into the everyday lives of um, stateless Kurds. There are 40 million of them, if I'm correct, um, out there. And it's a book about identity, it's about resilience, it's about fighting for justice and freedom. Um, and about family and about siblings and siblings love and, and their relationship. Uh, the Seattle Post called it uh, a searing, heart-rending tale. Uh, while this book is about a Kurdish family in Iran, the story could be about any minority living under the rule of an oppressive majority demanding their assimilation. Homa has created a story that's both uh, personal and universal in its scope. Daughters of Smoke and Fire might break your heart but it is also a book of sublime beauty that will engrave itself into your memory for years to come. That's beautiful, and I, I, I agree. Um, and uh, Booklist said, a coming-of-age story that layers intergenerational trauma and political commentary on a decades-long epic. Homa's portrait of Kurdish life in Iran brings readers closer to lived experience, experiences that force questions of identity, homeland, and the traumas we inherit. Um, Ava, can you talk a little bit about the novel? Just describe it in, in, your, own, in your own words. Uh, sure, thank you for that, Ayla. So uh, it's a story of uh, a Kurdish boy and a girl growing up in the Kurdish region of Iran. Um, and their father is from the Kurdish region of Iraq and their neighbor and best friend is from the Kurdish region of Syria. So it's uh, these um, two boys and a girl growing up together, two of them, Leila and Shia, they grew up under exactly similar conditions, same parents, same society, but then their gender played a big role in how they dealt with life and who they are. Um, I, I wanted to create a family in which the, every member has a different way of dealing with geopolitical oppression. Um, so the mother wants to go to sexual adventures and numb herself through sleep and food. The father is a news junkie who doesn't really know how to metabolize everything that he hears into a form of um, fighting, even though he did fight at one point and he was tortured for it. And the torture made a sh just a shallow 
uh, just a shell out of him uh, and killed a lot of what he had inside. And uh, the brother and sister of the brother is more into activism as the way to bring justice to his family and his people. And then the sister is more interested in arts. But then all these four paths intertwine and uh, diverge. And um, I wanted to explore, explore their lives and give a local flavor to the novel because so little has been written about Kurds, especially in fiction, almost none, almost none by Kurds themselves, actually. Um, and at the same time, I was hoping uh, to be able to present a universal um, story that a lot of people across, across the globe, when they read it, they feel that they're seen and they're heard and that they connect, they can connect with the story. Yeah, absolutely. I totally think it it, it is universal. Um, you know, I think many people can find themselves in it. Um, I wanted to ask you to read us an excerpt. Um, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about what you're reading or not. Maybe it doesn't need any any uh, preamble. Sure. And I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna turn myself off for that. Okay. So <laughs> I could say <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> I will be looking at the book anyway. Um, so I'm going to read a section for you when Leila and Shia's father, because um, a lot of time parents in Kurdistan, they try to not share their experience in order to shield and protect their children. Um, because the less you know under such a suppressive government, the safer you are. But then this one night he finally opens up and shares what it's like to be in one of those notorious prisons in Iran. And while he's doing that, he isn't aware that Leila is also listening to the story. Leila is hiding in her room and just um, trying to overhear what's going on. So it starts by Chia, the brother, asking, how would it happen when you are in prison? Chia pressed his luck. Um, at midnight, Baba said, they would call names. We were 80 inmates in one wing, sometimes more, sometimes less. Anyone whose name was called after the sun went down never came back. I perked up my ears from my invisible post. Baba's gaze remained on the flowers woven into the rock, his expression neutral, reminiscent. We would listen for and count the gunshots right before the sunrise, and with a fork, we'd engrave the date and the estimated number of people executed on the walls of our cells. I steadied myself on the door frame. My brother sat rigidly. Baba continued stoically. Every time that loudspeaker cracked, every time a guard turned it on and blew into it, every time someone whose name started with Ah was called, he stopped and glanced at Chia, through Chia, as if Chia weren't there. The ones who were called had only a few moments to give their friends and cellmates any useful belongings they had, a share, a pair of shoes, a comb. And they might ask for something to be sent to their parents, wives and children, like their diaries, drawings, handicrafts they had made in prison with inedible dough, then their friends. Baba squeezed his eyes, bit at the corner of his cracked, bloodless lips. After the men were taken away, their friends would light a candle if they had one, would pass it on some dates if they had any, and would shed tears if they still had some left in them, that kind of stuff. They would gather the few possessions they had to give the executed something like a funeral, some acknowledgement of their existence in a place that wished to annihilate us all. Chia cleared her throat and asked in a gravely voice, was that the worst part when a friend was taken? My father looked away, rubbed his face, and pressed his finger to his temple as if he were focusing on something. I wanted to run and grab a glass of water for Baba, whose lips had dried up, but I stayed put. Once, a plainclothes man walked in with a flashlight in his hands. He wheezed, looked the other way. Memories were crowding in. I held my breath so I wouldn't miss a single word. Three guards followed the man who was clearly an Etalad agent. The intelligence service, Chia breathed. Baba continued. It was past midnight and the central lights of the prison had all been turned off. We were about 12 cellmates then, Joanna's husband among us, their daughter to be born the day after. We were ordered to stay in a line, 
to stand in a line and face this figure who walked before us, directing his flashlight at us. He pointed his index finger and ordered an unlucky prisoner to step forward from the line. His blinding light then flashed into my face. I shut my eyes and frowns on a reflex. Baba's lips stayed low, slurring his speech. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Um, it's very moving. Um, you, you already mentioned um, that hasn't been much written uh, on, on, the, on the plight of the Kurdish people. And even when there was, it's generally about Iraq and about Syria, not so much about Iran. Um, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what it means to be a Kurdish person living in Iran, a Kurdish woman uh, living in Iran. Right. Um, so I think the fact that boy, the Kurdish voice has been mutilated through, throughout history says more about the kind of world we live in than about Kurds themselves, right? Kurds had their land, uh, have had it since antiquity. Um, Kurds from generations ago, before people started talking about religious diversity, had religious diversity. We had a lot of Jewish Kurds, Christian Kurds, Muslim Kurds, uh, Zoroastrian Kurds, Yazidi Kurds. Um, and then the allies started to redraw the map of the Middle East after the first war war. And then they decided that uh, first day in one treaty, they decided to give the Kurds their land, and then they decided, well, it's not really in the interest of the world powers if the Kurds have a land. And that, that, that's when it started, 100 years of not having a country in a world where nation states were formed and were so important. So what happens to you when you don't exist on the map? when people don't know about you, when you live in your own region, but the four countries that rule over you see you as a threat, not as humans. And they do everything in their power to destroy you. And they find different ways to destroy you. Sometimes it's just outright genocide. They come out and they bomb you. They come out and they burn your villages and rape your women. And there's physical attack, right? And then there is what Iran does, which is, in addition to executions, in addition to daily killings of people, um, they come and try to take away your identity from you. Same thing also happens in Turkey when they institutionalize racism. You're not allowed to learn your language. And who are you if you are so fluent in your colonizer's language, but you can't read your own literature, you don't know what your own poets sound like, you don't know what your history is, and your history is omitted. It's nowhere, it's not in the media, it's not in your textbook. And that moment when you realize that, oh my God, then who am I? I want to be a Kurd, or do I want to be a Kurd? And what's the price I will pay for that decision that I make? And then I think the most beautiful thing that happened to a person in that situation is when you come across good book, literary fiction that takes you to other part of the world and you realize, oh my God, I have so many brothers and sisters in Rwanda in Bosnia. Yeah. And like I can connect to all these minorities across from the world. Yeah. Um, wow, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I feel like um, reading, you know, diverse that you're reading writers of color uh, at an early uh, point in my literary education totally changed how I saw myself as well. Sometimes you can see yourself in unexpected places. Exactly. Um, I, I want to quote from an essay you wrote uh, uh, for LitHub. Um, I don't remember the name of the essay. Maybe you can remind me. Uh, why resistance is foundational. I think that's, that's right. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so I want to just read a quote. It says this, uh, coming of age as a Kurdish girl in Iran, I learned early on that my being alive was an act, an act of subversion. Those of us who survived the physical erasure of our lives, like you said, faced destruction. The states that ruled over us told us we didn't exist, or if we did, we were merely what they named us. Uh, I'm skipping a little bit. We gradually lost part of parts of our heritage. Our language and history were banned. Our pain was ridiculed and used against us. We were reduced to subhumans in ways that shattered our pride and dignity. And you just mentioned, you know, that you found brothers and sisters around the world. I think that the description bears resemblance to other you know, oppressed groups in the world, other marginalized groups in the world. And in a couple of places in the book, you actually mention indigenous res residential schools, 
uh, in North America, there's a, pi there's a part where Caro says about his sister, he says, um, one of the characters in the book, um, no spoiler alerts. Um, he says, my sister draws parallel between Kurds and the indigenous people in North America. And I thought that was such a good way to provide context for North American readers. Um, I assume that was your intention. I just wanted to know uh, if you, when you discovered that, that um, situation in Canada, if you felt a certain kinship. Uh, yeah, if you can just talk a little bit about that as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think the idea of, uh, um, there are so many similarities that I see. For example, one of the things that have hurt me deeply is the suicide rate among Kurdish women in Iran. And when I was trying to do something about that, and when I realized talking at the United Nations about it didn't change anything, was I formed a, an informal group with a friends and we decided to adopt and create material that had to do with suicide prevention. And guess where I find most of my material? In Canada, right? Where, when we have the highest rate of teenage suicide among the Aboriginals. And, uh, and I, there is so much, so much similarity that I see about two generations, the generations that went through physical annihilation um, and the children of those parents that whose parents didn't know how to love them and their children think that there isn't a whole lot to living. And what happens to you when death becomes the only solution? And it's also your loudest protest. Why isn't there any other way for you to tell you how outraged you are other than take away your own right to live? Um, and also the idea of blaming the victim that, oh, these people, they're, they're not the best, you know, they don't do a whole lot for themselves, it's their fault. And that's such a lazy and in a way disgusting way of looking at how unfair and our world is. Um, so then the idea of once you understand that, once you understand who you belong to, then now what? Now, what are you going to do? How are you going to craft your anger and outrage? How are you allowing your outrage to be something that's at your service as opposed to something that consume you? Because it's so easy to be consumed by injustice and anger. Yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, I came across this quote uh, on Twitter, a tweet, uh, by, but by uh, author Viet Tan Yen, uh, uh, was a refugee and writer, uh, lives in the U.S., and I, I just loved it. It says this, writers from a minority write as if you are the majority. Do not explain, do not cater, do not translate, do not apologize. Write with all the privileges of the majority, but with the humility of a minority. And I was wondering, um, I mean, this is something I've struggled with and I bumped against as well. How do we do that? How do we convey, convey such a complex history and, and the, subtle, the subtleties of, and the complexities of the culture uh, to an audience that knows so little? How do we do that without being overly didactic um, and without catering to the majority? I mean, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? I'm sure you have also <laughs> thought about it a million times as you go through drafts and drafts and drafts, uh, especially when it comes to fiction, because when a Kurdish character talks to another Kurdish character, they won't explain things they both know. No. <laughs> <laughs> and so how would you, how many techniques can you find to convey that? Like how many times can Leila walk by when the father is watching the news that says this many people were killed and executed today. <laughs> like how many techniques can you find? <laughs> and that question, who do you write for really? Like, That's um, right. right. That was and, my next question. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, at the end of the day, I know that I'm not writing popular novels. I'm not writing 50 shades of gray. Right. So I'm <laughs> targeting a very specific audience, the audience that's interested <laughs> in learning about the rest of the world. And I looked at how I felt when I was reading literature that was set in other parts of the world. And I don't think my idea of a good novel was the one that answered all my questions. A good literary fiction that was set in places where I have no access to, or I have limited access to is novels that drew me in and put a human face on these people that I don't know. And then that yeah. made me curious enough to now pick up a nonfiction, right? Right, so and then I learn think more. Yeah. So I yeah. think if, if you read a novel and that 
gives you enough that you can feel what these characters feel and why they they do things they do you understand their motivation and their environment like i want it there's like so much sense of smell in the book i want people to know what kurdistan smells like i really appreciate it by the way i always <laughs> talk about it i write a lot about smell i think it's yeah. one of the sensory details that really brings something to life so that's why i, I love that that's why we, i thought we were sisters in that's writing. right <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I, I i feel like i had something to say just about uh what you said a second ago, and now I forgot. Who do uh, I write? Who do you write for? Again, yeah, yeah, and what you said too. I love that. That really just um, that it would make you interested enough to go and learn about it and give the reader credit, basically, yeah. that they can do that if they want to know more. I think what is lacking in our world is it was lack of curiosity, and that's what uh, exclusion is rooted in: not knowing the underrepresented. So, and then also missing out on the curiosity to go and understand and learn about them because it's not the hardest thing to do in this time and age. Mm -hmm. So I think the best novels create that curiosity, um, portray the humanity of the group that you don't know much about. And then it just, it doesn't serve the underrepresented community as much as it serves me. It opens my heart, you know? Yeah. It, it, it helps me be more humane. It helps me that, that. be genuinely non-racist without having to fight some deep racism that I have inside me, right? So yeah, that's what literary fiction does for us. I think it's very eye-opening. and yeah. uh, I, I am more heart of a opening. reader than a, yeah, heart opening for I sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I consider myself more of a reader than a writer. I mean, I have to read it. It's, it's, it's a good day if I write, but I have to read every day. I can't not read it. I owe so much of what I know and I feel and am in this world to, to books, to good books. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about how this book uh, came about and what inspired it. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned uh, in your notes and you mentioned other places, um, Farzad Kamangar. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about him? Or you also, by, in the in the dedication, you actually, he's one of the people you dedicated to, oh. and you say for imagining otherwise. Right. So going back to imagining otherwise, I think this is our duty as humans to 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 not accept reality as this is how it should be, but that's as how it is, and then push for how it should be, right? And that comes from imagining something different from what we see around us, right? Uh, and I think that's what he did. And the reason he became my hero is because, yes, I have read a lot about Nelson Mandela and Gandhi and a lot of these uh, leaders around the world who were able to turn uh, the hatred that they received and have this personal transformation when they that they ended up giving hope and love to this world as opposed to um, violence and destruction and so they become this uh, transformer and how did they become has always fascinated me how do we as humans uh, become something that is different from our default, is out of our comfort zone, is different from what everyone in our society tells us to be. And Farza became my hero because he wasn't someone out there. He was Kurdish. He was my age. He was humble. He was just a teacher. He had no claims to anything. And he wrote letters. And not only he had a beautiful voice that made his letters go viral, I still don't understand how someone can be in prison, can be tortured day in and day out, and still talk about hope and humanity. How can you keep your hope and humanity intact in a situation like that, right? Yeah. yeah. And yes, and then after writing his story, I started to imagine what his sister's life would be like if he had a sister who couldn't do everything that he has done, who was pushed okay. towards suicide. How could so she how then find strength? About. Yeah. Hmm. That's how the inspiration of the book came about. So you started basically from Shia. Yes, I did. Yes. But then it became Shia Layla's story because I went through so many drafts and kept revising and revising and revising. Yeah. And um, coincidentally, he was executed, I should say. Uh, and he was, um, it was 10 years ago. Um, yes. On the day of your, the, the book launch, which is. Yeah. Incredible. What an incredible coincidence 
And I feel like one of the reasons that these people speaks, this book speaks to people is because a little bit of his voice and his soul comes through this book. And I still don't know why a stranger shook me so much, but everyone tells me that his chapter is one of the strongest chapters in the book and it's all owed to him and what he shifted in me. Yeah. So you have only a, two, two chapters, right? In the, in the book that suddenly uh, stare away from uh, Layla's voice, right? Yes. Uh, one is the father and one is the brother. Uh, and I thought that was, I, I really like that shift. Um, you know, like we, especially when you're taught, you know, you're supposed to write a novel a certain way. And I'm like, oh, actually you can just do that. Mm -hmm. um, I really appreciate that. Uh, and it was a chance for you to give a bit of uh, the, the, the father and the, the brother's point of view and perspective in a first person narrative because the right. book is told in the latest first person um are you the kind of writer who outlines or, or do you just kind of go into the dark and and <laughs> hope for the best i think a little bit of both it's funny how the western world is all about have a discipline have an outline have sticky notes <laughs> and write as if <laughs> as if there is a formula to writing novels that you can apply magically. <laughs> and then the Wouldn't Eastern world, nice? yeah. The Eastern world is all about inspiration that the muses visit you today and call you. Yeah, yeah. And can you find something in between? Can you just find what actually works for you? And I think the most important thing I learned I is so. that I can't impose anything on how this novel starts to grow in me. I, it has to take its own path, honestly. Um, yeah. Sometimes I, the novel grows by me actually typing at my computer, sometimes by just me walking. Sometimes I wake up and I know how this chapter should start and end. And right. so I avoid giving advice. I avoid receiving advice. My, my thing is just try to figure out what works for me because it may not work for anyone else. And, and it and may how. not work in this next book too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Every book, it has its own. Yeah, yep. its own. I think as long as you allow it to be organic, and I'm not saying I never outline, sometimes I do want to have a general idea of how things work out, but more than 90% of the time when it comes to actually writing the chapters, then they just become something else. Of its own life. Yeah, definitely. And especially when it and comes to characterization, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, that I write like thousands and thousands of words just trying to understand who my characters are. And then I end up discarding all of that, not actually using them in the final part. Right. But that was me meeting them. Yeah, getting to know them. Yeah, like understanding what their childhood was, what was it like for the first time they fell in love, what was their first heartbreak like, and mm -hmm. how did they discover their sexuality, how, what do they think about their position in the world, and things like that. And it took you 10 years. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> No, but no. it's really difficult. <laughs> like you said, like writing in your third language, right? Creating, presenting a world that's so unfamiliar um, yeah. and doing justice to that world and doing mm -hmm. justice to your reader by telling, giving them a truthful and finding balance between joy and suffering and me making politics and history and fiction meet. So it was such an ambitious project. I'm not, I don't regret that I spent so much time in, on it, but it, it was, it involved a lot of trial and error and involved a lot of figuring things out. And maybe that has to do with the fact that I don't listen to advice much and I try to find my own way in life. But uh, yeah. I think it was worth it. I can say proudly that every I, scene. I think so too. Yeah. I think so too. So Layla, um, she's such a, a wonderfully flawed character. Uh, I really grew to love her, and I think that's a part of the charm of the book, you know. She, in the beginning, uh, she's not, you know, necessarily easy to love right away, mm -hmm. and I, I, I like that about her. Um, I mean, generally, you have such great character, female characters in the book. We have, uh, uh, now I know you say it, Schleyer. Yes, I, I said it a bit different in my head. Uh, I think Layla's mother is a wonderful character. Um, Joanna who is lovable right away, <laughs> right away. Um, and you also, uh, you know, you mentioned, you, I said you dedicated to um, Farzad, but you also dedicated to Kurdish women um, for flourishing in barren fields, you wrote. Um, so was that important to you to create those strong and, and complex uh, female Kurdish characters? 
Um, I like I said, I, I it's it's important for me to stay uh, to do justice to in terms of to stay loyal to what's actually there. And um, so, how do you character female care? How do you create female characters that, on one hand, uh, are willing to set their bodies in fire as the loudest protest and the loudest cry for help, and at the same time, you create female characters who not only save themselves, but they also extend the hand and say to other minority women, to other Kurdish women that, hey, it's possible. It's possible to have a voice. It's possible to be alive. It's possible to enjoy life despite everything. And what Kurdish women suffer from is a combination of statelessness, patriarchy, economic deprivation, and there's so much. So when a Kurdish woman makes her way out of all of this, out of the mass graves, out of the mourning, out of living in a society where lives are considered not worthy of grieving, uh, then yes, I think they do uh, deserve a whole lot of aqua, right? Whether it is Kurdish mm -hmm. women like Leila Zana, who became parliamentarian and were put in prison for 10 years for just saying a sentence in Kurdish, whether it is the artists, wow. the filmmakers, the poets, um, and all of those women who have done all this. And this, they are the reason that I thought that I can too, despite everyone telling me that you're a woman, you really, your limitations, you know, there is a limitation mm. to your capabilities. And this is how God meant it. And you can't argue with God, can you? And people telling me, oh, you're Kurdish and there's only so much you can achieve in life. And, um, mm -hmm. and so seeing how other Kurdish women were able to come out of this sludge regardless, despite all this oppression and create beautiful things, helped me think that it's also possible for me. And so when it came to creating female characters, Kurdish characters, I need a balance. I need to be honest to the fact that some characters just give in or give up. And there are other characters who rise above it. And mm -hmm. just creating complicated female characters is really your, I think our duty as novelists, because so many times male novelists who have created wonderfully complex male protagonists have miserably failed at creating female characters. Right? Oh yeah. Oh, so yeah. how do you balance all that? So you want to be realistic. You want to also show that it's possible to be strong. And um, I think at the end, to me, it comes down to creating that complexity to make it believable mm -hmm. that even someone like Layla's mother, Hannah, who is somewhat despicable, she still has her own complexity. She still has her own reasons for doing what yeah. she does. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the same essay that I mentioned before uh, in LitHub, you mentioned um, a, a Kurdish, a, a common mantra uh, that says resistance is life. Yeah. Uh, and obviously your, your three main characters all, you know, embody that uh, in different ways. Um, I wonder how you see your act of resistance and if you can speak about that. Um, so when you belong to people who have been targeted repeatedly throughout history because of their ethnicity, right? When your life, life is something that the rest of the world either wants to annihilate or just doesn't outright, doesn't respect you, right? When I first came to Canada, no one had heard of Kurds. When I started writing this book, no one had heard of Kurds, right? It was only after Islamic State came to power and Kurdish women were suddenly known that, oh, wait a minute, here are these Kurdish women who fight ISIS. Um, yeah. So, uh, and that every time you're trying to build something, someone easily comes and ruins it for you. Look at what happened just last October, that um, Syrian Kurds were able to create these gender egalitarian, environmentally, French, environmentally friendly mm -hmm. environment where they focus on democracy, gender equality, and, and um, and uh, an environment and then suddenly Trump decided to pull out and yeah. Turkey came and destroyed in that. So what do you tell yourself? Like, how can you go on? You know, how can you keep pushing? How can you define yourself? And, and that's when this mantra comes in, Berkhodan Jiana, Berkhodan Jiana, your life is in your resistance. And mm -hmm. I watched videos of really young Kurdish girls and boys singing Berkhodan Jiana, Berkhodan Jiana. And I think for, for a, a lot of minorities and especially for Kurds, when you're under so many levels of oppression, 
the only way you can define yourself and your life is through resistance because mm -hmm. if you don't resist then who are you then what's left of you if you don't have a country that means like and when i say you don't have a country you're omitted even from studies academic studies so you look at academic studies like middle eastern studies in some of the best universities across the world persian studies are there turkish studies kurdish studies are rarely ever there so you don't wow. even exist in academia where are you who are you where do you find yourself and that's why and in literature even in literature you don't exist anywhere yeah. and the few books that are written about kurds they are written from the perspective of this ethnocentric Western idea when Kurds are always compared to another culture and defined in relation to another culture. We are denied our rights to just be, to just be humans, you know? Yeah. And we are always, uh, so we either not seen or we're seen through an ethnocentric lens. Um, yeah. And we're seen with pity or we're blamed or we're named. And, and so you, you have to resist. You don't have a choice. I don't think you have a choice. So your book, is that an act of resistance? Definitely, yes. As a woman, as a Kurd, as an immigrant, mm -hmm. um, to have a voice is really my best way of saying that to the oppressor that, I'm sorry, but you were wrong. Mm -hmm. You can mutilate us. We exist. We have a voice. We can create work. We can create beautiful work. And we exist through literature. You can destroy books. Um. It says everywhere uh, that this is the first novel uh, published in English by a female Kurdish writer. And I wonder um, if it feels a bit heavy, if, if this is a burden, um, does it instill a sense of beauty or you already have that sense of beauty and maybe you came to writing the book already with that very much, uh, very strong in you? Uh, is it paralyzing? How does it, how does it feel? It's uh, all of those things. It's definitely all of those things. But like I said, this says more about the world we live in and the world that mutilates female voices and the world that mutilates immigrant voices and the world that writes anti-refugee waves and a world that doesn't like to hear from ethnic minorities. So it's mm -hmm. not that Kurdish women have been lazy or uncreative or unimaginative. It's just that they haven't been a chance to flourish and how many options do you have when you're on a survival mode? When just staying alive is something you have to fight for, right? Yeah. Um, and then this burden of representation, I am just one voice, you know? Um, and a Kurdish woman may not have written many novels in English before, but they have done so much. They have done so much in this world. A lot of us owe our safety to what Kurdish women accomplish in defeating ISIS because ISIS was the most scared of Kurdish women because they were killing themselves with their idea of going to heaven and they always thought that if a woman kills you you won't even go to heaven so just imagine the fear that your existence and your fight instills in these people right wow. yeah um, so like I said I have been inspired by a lot of other Kurdish women and there, there are a lot of Kurdish women in academia uh, a lot of Kurdish women are studying or teaching in so many universities across the yeah. world. Um, Doing their part in other ways. On other ways, yes. But yeah. at the same time, yeah. I refuse to say that my book represents everything. Obviously, Kurds are a lot more complex than a, a book can say. Sure. Yeah, and I don't think you can. Like no, it's it, that, that, that would be paralyzing, I think, oh, trying yeah, to carry that um, yeah. for sure. Uh, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, language and then maybe we can open it up uh, for questions, um, mm -hmm. open the floor, the metaphorical floor. Mm -hmm. um, so have you, before before moving to Canada, how, how old were you when you, you moved? You were an adult by then. I was 24. Okay. Um, and before that, were you writing in Farsi? Mm -hmm. um, you were. So yeah. I'd... I'm, I'm going to talk about it as if like I've never heard of anyone doing that. <laughs> uh, so you arrive in Canada and very, not that long after, was it what, three years after that you were writing in, in English? I, I was trying to do the math. I'm maybe wrong. Tell me how that happened. Like, how do you? So master, I was a, yeah. 
I was a reader of English for years before I wrote okay. in English, right? Uh, so um, growing up on that small town on the borders of Iran and Iraq and looking around me, looking at all the men and women around me, I didn't see a whole lot of role models. I didn't want to live the lives they lived. And how did I want, how could I shape a different life for me? Um, and I was lucky that I grew up in a home that was full of books. There were some English books that I couldn't read at that age, but every, every room you went into, the, the bedrooms, the basements, even the bathroom was full of books. And I grew up in this age when we didn't have a lot of distraction. There was maybe one hour of TV I could watch that had like children's program and not much else. And what yeah. do you do with all that time on your hand? You start reading at an early age. And I realized that I was more interested in what books were offering me than what my and small reality really i didn't ha we didn't have internet at the time and so it was what my eyes could see and what books could offer me though there were those two worlds and then when i i majored in english literature in iran and okay. i fell in love with emily dickinson with ernest hemingway and i could travel through literally i know people have heard this as a cliche and they may be sick of it but for me it was literal uh, finding something outside of what was presented to me through English literature. And so mm -hmm. I read and read and read and I read so much that I found I, I was able to understand the flavor of English words. And then it just became, it wasn't easy in the beginning, but then slowly I realized that while I was trying to write, it was just, my mind would grab at English words better than it would grab. Mm. It. And it, it just happens through reading and also through a lot of writing. And this was another thing that I was told was impossible. You know, the same voices that told me, you're a woman or you're Kurdish, you're from Iran, you can't do anything. Yeah. Told me, you, you can't create literary work in your third language when you right. travel, when you relocate in your 20s. Maybe people who grew up there, not even that, only people who have been there for generations can do this. Mm -hmm. And I kind of debunked that myth too. And I'm glad that I did. And I, I believed this think? for a while. I believed this. I feared yeah. it. I had a lot of self-doubt. I never thought this day would happen. But then I wrote not because I hoped to be published or read. I wrote because because writing is such an existential thing for me. You know, I came made my way out of Kurdistan and out of Iran and physically, but also just mentally through reading and writing. And I wasn't going to give up on it when I came to Canada. So I kept that in and I'm glad that one day someone said my incredible agent whom i love dearly and he's here today said this is a good book i think i can sell it and i told chris uh, no no one's gonna buy it no one <laughs> wants to read a book <laughs> and then he fought for me and he found me two really really good editors so I do you that. think that it might have been easier to write about certain things in uh in that in english there was a certain distance that allowed you to maybe access things that are just hard or traumatic. Absolutely. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's this aesthetic distance and there's this psychological distance. Uh, it gives you perspective. You are not too submerged in it. You can take a step aside and look at your world through this language. And also just concepts, like a concept like abuse, like emotional abuse. It didn't even exist in Persian or in Kurdish. No one spoke about it. No one spoke of it as a negative things. And yet it was something that was happening every day, day in and day out, and it was normalized. And then when I heard and learned for the, the word abuse, that it was liberating, that what I had known for years that was bothering me, but didn't exist in the language, exists somewhere as a concept. Mm -hmm. Or like so many things, the difference between gender and sex, that you kind of feel it, but you came, come to understand it when you read about it somewhere. So there's mm -hmm. a lot that writing in three languages offers you. Also reading in three languages offers you. Also interviewing people, because I had to interview a lot of people for this book, uh, offers you where you can interview them in all these languages. So mm -hmm. it's an uphill battle, but it's so worth it. And for anyone who has a passion for writing and they're told that they can do it, if it's if what's in your heart, you can definitely do it. It will take time. It was like a lot, thousands and millions of hours. But if you, that's what you want to do, you can do it for sure. 
Um, my last question for you. I have many more, but I want to <laughs> let you know other people ask their questions as well. What do you hope readers, uh, North American readers, I should say, take away from the book? Um, you know what? Uh, this you know, is. What is it that you hope they'll understand better, perhaps, as a, as a way of putting it as well? I think at this time of the pandemic, it is the best time for us to reflect on what we accepted as normal, what we accepted as our reality, and think about a radically different reality. And that radically different reality comes from us understanding our interdependence and asking ourselves, so I want to know, like, I really miss strangers now. Did we have that before? Did we realize at all in our lives that how meaningful it was to share physical space with people? Had we thought about handshake before, how we had taken it for granted, right? So <laughs> how can we, if we are to survive this pandemic and take the time to reflect in our lives, how can we create a radically different reality, a world that's more inclusive, a world, a world that doesn't divide people into people and unpeople, right? Doesn't divide the world into grievable lives and ungrievable lives. And uh, I think this book is one of the many forces out there that are pushing us toward understanding that when we discriminate and when we exclude, we are harming ourselves as much as we're harming the rest of the communities. So, yeah. um, I'm not trying to tell, give a message. I hope that I can tell a good story that people are interested good in goal. their characters and just enjoy it. I hope the book brings joy, even though it's a difficult topic. I admit it was difficult for me to write. Um, I haven't actually in real life lost someone close to me yet, but through this book, I imagine losing someone so close to you. And mm -hmm. like I said, I put my heart and soul into it and uh, there have been good teams behind me at HarperCollins and, uh, and Abram trying to make, create a very fine product. And I hope that this book bring joy, really. The joy of stories, the joy of understanding other humans, the joy of finding out how similar we are and how much we have in common and how much we need each other. Yeah. So yeah, um, you should all buy the book. And then after you read it and love it, you should review it on Amazon uh, and Goodreads and all of those things. Uh, it actually uh, really helps authors. Um, I was hoping you'd read us uh, one final uh, segment um, before sure. we break into, into questions. Should I uh, continue reading what I read? I don't know, what do you feel like? You want to maybe give us a little bit more of a flavor? Okay. All right, so I'll read this section when Leila and Carl uh, go out and try to have a conversation. There's a mutual attraction between them that they haven't admitted to yet. And then what happens is that they find themselves in the middle of a protest and riot police chasing protesters. <laughs> and this is how they try to save themselves. Um, before I got a chance to redirect the conversation, however, I was shoved by a frantic crowd running down the stairs. A wave of people charged toward us. I was rooted to the spot in fear. Kara looked around, yanked my hand, and we ran as fast as we could. The panic crowd jostled us in their hurry to flee. Gunshots cracked through the air. People screamed. To the riot police, everyone was a criminal whose innocence was impossible to prove. I ran as fast as I could, but my lungs gave up. To the wall, to the wall, Carl pointed. I did as he said. He removed my little knapsack and had me wear it in front, which let hordes of people pass us without pushing and jostling. But the police were getting closer and pepper spraying their victims. Carl carefully scanned the area. Come, he grasped my hand and we turned into a side street. Small streets are a, <clears throat> sorry. Small streets are a trap, I panted. People were frantically knocking on random doors. Every now and there, a door would open and someone would pull the first few people inside before shutting the gates again. I know what I'm doing, Kara pulled at my arm and we ran out an even narrower alley. I was hysterical. If we get arrested, I'm the one who gets killed, not your half Persian ass. 
Kara drew me inside a medical center to our right, which I hadn't noticed until that very moment. Another couple followed behind us. Act ill if they come in. Act ill? I can't act. I freed my arm from his grasp. They won't feel bad for a man. Just cry and wail like you're in pain, can you? If only he knew. A few more people rushed inside the clinic after us, and an older man closed the door. Better to save a few than none, he said as he turned to survey the terrified crowd. We exchanged guilty glances, but, our, but no one objected. Our shame was overpowered by the will to survive. Caro and I ran down a staircase and crept inside a busy laboratory. Act pregnant. What on earth is that supposed to mean? I winced against the antiseptic chemical smell. We have to act like we're married and we'll draw attention. Caro then pointed to another couple whom we had seen among the protesters. The woman was resting a hand on her hip and pressing her belly with the other hand. Sweat dripped down my spine and neck. A lab technician winked at us and gave us some of her medical folders. They were prepared to camouflage us. I burst into a nervous laughter. I didn't say act high, Caro whispered and grasped my shoulder. Congratulations, the other supposedly pregnant woman wiggled her eyebrows at me. I bent and waist with a hand on my stomach. Thank you, it's our first, Caro responded. I looked at his serious face as he rubbed my shoulder affectionately. He looked down at me reassuringly and my anger and fear evaporated. Life is perhaps that enclosed moment when my gaze destroys itself in the pupils of your eyes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ava. So also humor and action pack, there's a lot of layers. <laughs> I actually laughed uh, out loud as, as you were as you were reading. Um, so thank you so much uh, for this great conversation. Um, and I am hoping that Lauren is going to jump in now and help us uh, with moderating questions. Hi, Lauren. Hi, that was so enriching and full mm -hmm. and um, moving, that conversation. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so Wonderful. much. Thank you. Um, and also, I, I just, one of the most interesting things for me reading your novel, Eva, is the, the brother-sister relationship and, yeah. and um, really looking into the humanity of that relationship as you've presented it and Layla as a real human, you know, like a real woman who, like you said, Ayelet is a little bit tricky at first um, to but you, you know, you feel for her, but she, she's uh, obviously working with depression and things like that. And, and um, yeah, that just the echoes with my own work about sibling relationships, I find really fascinating. Yes. So, so good. Okay. <laughs> there are some questions. And uh, how do you say, is it Kaya, the, the brother's name? Chia? Chia, okay. Chia. Um, so there is a question from uh, Chia living in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, who's tuned in and, and listening. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Chia yeah. is here. <laughs> he asked me about the title of the novel and how the title of the novel represents the story of the novel and also sends kind regards and says, well done. Sure. Um, yeah, Chia, that name means, means mountain, and it's very symbolic in the sense that there, there's an old saying that says, cars have no friends but mountains, and it's been so true throughout history. Um, so the question is how, uh, the, about the title choice. So Daughters of Smoke and Fire, fire is still representative in Kurdish culture. We celebrate the new year through fire. Um, uh, fire has roots deep in our history um pre-islam like true zoroastrian and yazidism and all of that um, in addition to that fire like i mentioned um in the book but also in my speech at the un that um setting your body on fire has become women's way of protesting uh to what's going on and everything that they suffer through and the story starts with Layla debating a path like that 
And so there is so much about smoke and fire and the idea of finding clarity despite the smoke that surrounds you and uh, and the fire and what it does, the warmth and the energy that it provides. Uh, and at the same time, it can burn you. So it has to do with the theme of the book throughout that is sprinkled. Um, and yeah, I hope I answered the question. Did you have other titles in mind before or was that pretty clear for you? No, the title changed a few times actually. Uh, it was initially Warrior Butterflies, which was another thing of just the conflict between the delicacy of a butterfly and the idea of being a warrior. Um, but you know, titles change <laughs> all the time. That, that conversation happens right at the beginning. Um, the simple worms. The yes. Man. Yeah. And worms can become butterflies or can they? How do you know if you're a caterpillar or you're just an earthworm? And, yeah. Yeah. and then uh, Farzana is asking a craft question. Uh, what was your biggest challenge or project with this novel? Right. I think uh, Ayala did a great job of pointing out a lot of my challenges. Uh, one is definitely how do you balance history and politics and fiction? How can you create a literary work that's primarily telling a story, but at the same time, you are writing the story of people that are so unknown? How do you balance that? How do you give enough flavor without being didactic and get be boring? Um, how do you break into North American publication industry uh, when you're talking about a topic that doesn't, that isn't initially exciting and of interest and there isn't a whole lot of curiosity about Kurds. Um, how do you tell the story of two generations, one that experienced a lot of violence firsthand and then the idea of inheriting trauma? Um, so there was so much that I had to figure out also this is important to remember that I grew up completely colonized. I grew up an empty shell. I learned about Kurds much later in life. In fact, when I was in Canada. So it was for me also relearning my history. And this was such a difficult thing for me to do, not only because I was embarrassed and ashamed of the disconnect, but also because every time I picked up a history book, I couldn't read it. It wasn't a kind of book that you could just read it in one setting and put it aside. Every chapter I had to take break. I had to go and just cry my eyes out and say, okay, what do I do with this reality now that I understand? How do I how do I deal with this? Can I turn this into art? And, and then obviously I went through periods of self-sabotage because the easiest thing to do when you're oppressed is you turn on yourself, you know? So I grew up with this book uh, and yeah. Do you, do you think that part of the process of writing the novel was working through that growing awareness and Absolutely, yes. Relearning and unlearning. Uh, unlearning everything that I have been taught, all the lies, all the reduction, representation, all the non-representation, all the naming, like Ayala mentioned, that they get to name you and they, uh, they kind of make you ashamed of yourself by how you are presented, right? So the two ways to destroy a human is hold a gun to their hand and say, say that, you're not who you think you are, like put aside your identity. And then the other thing is like, oh, no, you can, you can remain who you are, but you're not really cool. You're not interesting. You're not included. And, and even this question of when you want to say, okay, regardless, I want to be a Kurd, then what does that mean? Like if you can't read your own language, what makes you a Kurd, you know? So yeah, it was a lot that I had to balance and figure out. And you taught yourself Kurdish. Uh, yes, I am so glad that, that there was no time. <laughs> yes, I am so glad that I did. And it's just so beautiful. I, mean, I read more of our literature and um, it's amazing. It's yeah. an interesting discovery at such a late age, but um, yes. One of the things that I love about the novel so far, I'm not finished it, but um, is how it's peppered with references to to Kurdish writers. And mm. I, I love that because it's like this resource where you can then go and, and find other other writers and yeah. 
Absolutely. I think one of the loveliest emails I got, I got it yesterday from a woman who said, thank you for introducing me to the poetry of Sher Kobekas. I looked him up and me and my children now read some of his poetry. And I was like, yay, because I only have a few sentences from him. And one of the sentences I love is when he says, ask God to come down and be a Kurt for just one day. <laughs> yeah, which you quoted in the in Yeah, the in the book. Yeah. So Ega asks, uh, says, congratulations on the novel, Ava. I can't wait to read it. Yeah. How would you compare the experience of publishing this novel with publishing your short story collection a decade ago? Do you <laughs> still write short stories? Your story, Glass Slippers, really stayed with me. Oh, thank you, Ega. That's wonderful to hear. Uh, how do I compare publishing this novel? Yeah, um, experience of publishing this novel. I guess the, the process and right um, um, with the yeah. short story collection was it easier or harder? Or? No, it was actually much harder. I mean, um, when uh, I still do write short stories, I read more novels than before. I feel like um, I when I get to know a character now, I like to spend more time with them. Uh, I feel like writing short stories was a lot harder in the sense that you have such limited space to characterize and to have something as an as a story arc and end with something conclusive and conclusion at the end. Um, they're completely different experiences. And in terms of selling in the market, um, it's just it's just a whole different thing. I mean, Moenzi was interested in publishing my novel again and. Uh, I am so grateful to Bowensy House for having faith in me and uh, publishing my first book. But I was also hoping to, that I will reach a larger audience by going with a house that does more than printing the book. Um, and I was ready to go with Bowensy again until I met Chris and then everything changed since Chris came into my life. Because he was the one who said it's possible to to find other houses where I existed. So thank you, Chris. Which came first, the American publisher or the Canadian? At the same time, happened at the same time. I think Chris had a, had people bid on it, had an auction. Oh, good, yeah. Yeah. And then I think there was another question in the chat. Um, from Heather. Heather has asked a question. Yeah, she wanted to know if moving from Toronto uh, changed your perspective as you continue to work on the novel? I, I think I still spend most of the time of the year in Toronto. Uh, going to Bay Area, it just gives me the chance to hike more. And somehow I write better when I, I don't know what's the relationship between walking. <laughs> Lauren is laughing. I think writers can relate to that. But there is something about walking and writing that something happens in your brain. I know books have been written about it. Articles have been published about it. Um, so when I can uh, hike more, when I can go hide in the woods, somehow that's a lot more helpful to me understanding deeper layers to my story. And when there is too much noise and very little chance of being in the nature, I feel like my stories tend to remain more on surface. So I really appreciate um, the opportunity to hide in the woods. Big thing for me. <laughs> Um, are there any other questions or comments that people want to make? Um, my mom, I just have to read this. My mom Please. said, um, she made two comments. Uh, one's talking about how she's found through other works of fiction, parts of the real world that she's ignorant about, which I had so many echoes um, of books I've loved, like Half of a Yellow Sun. Yeah and uh, Behold the Dreamers and books that have really opened, you know, these other parts of the world that I didn't know too much about. And then she said, though I have known some of the basis of your book, I am ignorant of the human story behind it. Yours is a must read book. Thank you for it. Oh, thank, you. thank you so much. I mean, uh, it's one of the hardest things to do is admitting to my own ignorance about the rest of the world. And I am so grateful to other authors who have given me more than information. I think what novel, good novels have done for me is they have allowed me to slip in the skin of someone else and be Nigerian 
be African, be, be Chinese, be Vietnamese. Recently, I have read a lot of great author, uh, Vietnamese authors. And what's more beautiful than that, honestly, because our life is so short and so limited. And this is such an excellent way to, to be Yemenese, be in Israel, <laughs> and be native, be everything. Yeah. That's so valuable. So valuable. Oh, there's another question. I have found, Sandra says, I have found the readings and discussion very important. Is there a way to listen to the recording? I am grateful. Yes. Um, so all of the, P, the pandemic uh, response reading series events are recorded and posted at the bottom of the webpage, which is laurencarter.ca slash PRRS. So this will be up in a few days. I think we might be coming to the end unless there are any other questions. Um, thank you. Some thank yous from people. So we may be coming to the end. Well, I just wanted to say how grateful I am to you, Lauren, for organizing it. I know you're giving up on your own writing time to hold this uh, reading responses, and this is so meaningful and so helpful. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And I would for you to support my book and uh, right. come to my reading and ask these really thought provoking, difficult questions. <laughs> uh, reading your books, I have always felt like, oh my God, you know, I feel so close to this woman, but we Aww. never actually met in person. So this was a wonderful opportunity. And I'm so grateful to everyone who is here today. Thank you. Um, I'm so, so grateful to all of you for making the time to keep and come here and listen to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, Thank you so much. Thank you as well for this conversation and the book. Have Thank the you. book too. Sure. Thank you. Very important, valuable. All right. All right. All right. Thank you both <laughs> so much. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye. See you.